Okay. Good morning, everybody. I say this in all honesty, so I feel sorry for the Sundays. I do the Sunday school and Josh isn't doing it because you, you kind of catch me after I'm coming off a place of being <laughs> and my brain has to turn off. And that's why sometimes you, I'll be doing Sunday school class and my, my, the message is still doing this. But uh, that's something that... Uh, part of the joy of being a preacher. Usually once you get the message in the week, it, it kind of invades everything you think and do and watch. Okay, we'll start one. I think everybody's pretty well here. Heavenly Father, we just uh, now have this opportunity to reflect on what has become for many of us uh, uh, just a wonderful, guiding, encouraging passage of Scripture. It comes with uh, inherent correction, but it comes with great encouragement, and it teaches us what it means to be trained in righteousness. So we thank we are thankful that your word does not return void and that it will accomplish what you've intended. So Father, bring forth a great purpose from our discussion today. What a joy to be with God's people. All of us as brothers and sisters in Christ. Jew and Gentile, male and female, immersed into the body of Christ. We are one and yet many members. And with great joy we get to do all that we do to the, worth, to the worthiness of the Lamb, the one who was slain, who we want today to give all power and glory. All glory. And we long to see you, Jesus, when you come and you're glorified among your saints in that great and glorious day of salvation. Amen. Today's passage is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. I doubt if it's very new to most of you. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. We could get very technical about Hebrew po poetry and Hebrew wisdom literature, but Proverbs are basically just short statements of wisdom. Um, oftentimes we like them for that because they're short and to the point, they, cut, they say it clearly, there's no dancing around. It's, we, we like Proverbs for that reason. Many of us enjoy regularly or annually reading through the Proverbs. It's a great, great study to, to have. Uh, but I want to start with warning. This is a, I, I need to say this to you. Although it seems on the surface that it's so cut and dried, like when you start thinking about trust the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding and all your ways, you know. Like, what's difficult about that? Well, the answer is, there's lots. <laughs> And I don't want to set this lesson on a stage where it says, well, you have to be really an elitist to understand Proverbs. You don't. You just have to read. But please hear this warning, and I'll say it this way. Do not assume 
the verse or the proverb you read is saying it all. It is very hard to interpret. Go to Proverbs 26 for an example. And I could, I remember several years ago at a men's retreat, me going through several examples with the guys. This is one that I chose as an example of why Proverbs are difficult to interpret. Proverbs 26, 4 and 5. Verse 4. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him yourself. Now just think for a minute. Say you were one of those people that, we, like in my home growing up, my mom and dad had these little cards you pull out of the table and you read a verse. And, you know, and so you pull this card out of the table and you read, uh, a Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him yourself. Um, some people have taken that and they think in terms of don't cast your pearls before swine. You know, you know there's some people that, uh, you know, if they say something dumb, just don't answer them back because there's going to be, they're going, going to go from dumb, dumber to dumbest, and you're going to join them. But wait a minute. Verse 5 says, answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. I'm not going to explain that text. I'm not going to exegete that text. It's simply an example of why you don't look at the Bible as a series of Bible verses. The Bible is not a collection of verses. The Bible is a collection of books. You need to know that. And in spite of my upbringing and the many people I know who love to grab verses and things like that and do so to their edification, I have a very quiet and serious warning. Be careful. <laughs> Be careful. I could go on and on about Proverbs. Train up a child in the way he should go. When he's old, he will not return, uh, he will not return from it. <laughs> you don't take that at face value. You need to read more. You need to understand more. You just don't claim it and run with it. I warn you. So we're going into our first Proverbs verse, and I wanted to warn you, be careful about interpreting Proverbs just on what you see and not giving it some thought. There are many challenges to interpreting Proverbs, and all I'm going to say today, this is not a hermeneutical lesson, is consider the whole context and the setting and the whole and by that I mean the whole Bible. The whole Bible. Okay? So when you take a proverb that you enjoy and love, you need to work it through. I would, I would look at the immediate context. I would look at how it's used elsewhere in Proverbs. And I would look at how it fits with other teaching in the Bible to get a fuller and complete understanding. Some of the Proverbs are generalizations. They're not promises. And some well-meaning Christians take them as promises. You know? If you do such and such, then he will make all your enemies to be peace at you. Um, go to Pakistan and tell that to that person that's being ready to be martyred for their faith. The reason you're not having peace with the Muslims is because of your ungodly conduct. That isn't going to fly, is it? Generally, it's true. You live a righteous life and your enemies will be at peace, but not always. Oh, please forgive me when I say this. It's not always true because God is in the heavens and does what he wants. <laughs> and sometimes he wants to take his children home through the knife and the blade of a Muslim sword. I don't want them to. I don't like that, but it's true. So let's be careful when we take Proverbs. So I hope that's a warning that you're going to take beyond this lesson. Proverbs 3. I would ask you to look at that chapter. We're going to zero in on the text. We're going to start with a chapter. <clears throat> Proverbs 3. There are three sections in Proverbs 3. And grammatically, each one of them starts with the, the phrase, My son, do not forget my teaching. Or in verse 11, My son, do not despise the Lord's 
discipline. Or if you go to verse 21, we, we read, My son, do not lose sight of these. Keep sound wisdom and discretion. Uh, one of the things about reading Hebrew poetry and literature is it's written with that sort of literary style. And you have to look for these indicators as to the sections. When you're reading a, a Paul in Romans and he's teaching doctrine, it'll, it, those indicators are self-evident. But when you're reading poems, you have to look for these indicators. And that's why I would read the whole chapter, read, read the chapter, read, and suddenly it bounces off that, that these three sections are self-evident and our verse is in the first section. The first section that says, My son, do not forget my teaching. The second section says, My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline. So we know there's going to be issues there that fall out of that. But the section that we're dealing with is in that first uh, ten verses. My son, do not forget my teaching. And then it's going to be explained. And that gives us also another interpretive key. This is a daddy talking to his son. Okay? So, he, it's a daddy talking to his son, preparing him for adulthood and a righteous walk. That's what we need. To, we here today, in 2018, need to get into our spacesuits and go all the way back and put ourselves in this Hebrew text and say, here's a Hebrew daddy talking to his boy. And you can picture, you know, it's graduation at the, his high school. They didn't have high schools in Judaism, but today they did. And, 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 he, and he said, son, I want, there's some things before you leave home I want you to know. And one of them is, don't forget my teaching. And then he's going to explain on it. So, so, so have that mindset as you're, as you're reading Proverbs. Uh, don't read them just as one little verse here and there. So our memory verse is contained in this section. Our memory verse is in verses 5 and 6. In this section there are a total of five admonitions. What would be a better word for me to use than admonitions? Just shut it out. What, if I didn't say admonitions, what would it be? Eh? Sorry? Warnings. warnings could be, yeah, it would contain a warning. An appeal. A plea, you know, there are five of them here. There are under this section, son, don't forget my teaching. There are five of them, and as I look at them, I come up with this sentence. Now, you may look at it, come up with a different sentence, but essentially, we're going to say the same thing. Son, give up your self centered fantasies. Those of us who have had children grow up and get ready to leave home. That's the one thing we say to them. And isn't it a joy as a parent when a few years later they come back and they say, Mom, Dad, you were right. <laughs> you were right. But the one thing we want to tell them is, you know what? You think everything's just going to fall into place? Wrong. You think everything's just going to be wonderful? You, got your, you think your plans are just going to be just Wonderful? No. But anyway, so this daddy is saying, listen, you've got all these imaginations and fantasies about what's going to happen in your life. I want you to lose them right now. And I'm going to give you a reality check. I'm going to give you a reality check. The first thing he says in verses 3 and 4, and verses 1 and 2 are, are, are just introduction, is uh, give up your prideful independence. You have a responsibility to man and God. You know, young people can leave home and think that it's all about them. And maybe they've heard lots of teaching as you, don't be a man pleaser, don't be a this kind of person, don't be that kind of person. Listen, our kids need to leave home and realize there's a God they're accountable to and they are accountable to people. They need to care about people. They need to care. They're going to get a job. They better care about work showing up on time. Otherwise, they're not going to have a job. They, get, they need to care. Give up that prideful independence that says, I can do whatever I want. That's what he basically says in verses 3 and 4. 
I'm going to skip 5 and 6. We're going to come back to it. In verses 3 to 7, he says, give up the idea you can live by your own rules. Give up the idea that you can live by your own rules. Don't be wise in your own eyes. You just, you're not a self-governed, autonomous person, young man or young lady. Uh, there's rules to live life by. And by the way, that's why we as parents, one of the reasons, not the only reason, not even the most important reason, but one of the reasons we have structure in our home so that when our kids leave home, they realize that, oh, I can't just do what I want when I want. So daddy, daddy does this with this guy. Hey, think about other people. Think about your relationship with God as you leave the home. Then st stepping down to number three, and remember that you don't live by your own rules. Don't be s smart in your own eyes. I almost said a word that was crass, but you know what I almost said. You know, don't be that kind of a person. Ed, Ed got it. He's smiling over here. Number four, give up the idea that what you have is yours. Honor the, fir honor the first fruits of your income. What a great thing to teach your child as they're going out the door. Remember that all that God blesses you with, he, he's to get the first fruits. He gets the first cut. Now we teach that, and in fact, recently I, I brought that to bear on a teaching session in our church. But just think what it would be like a daddy, and let's, let, I'll be, I'll be uh, really inclusive here, daddy, mommy, talking to a son or daughter, and saying, hey, remember to, remember to honor God with your income. You're going to get an education, you're going to get a job. Remember to honor him with your income. And then fifthly, the next section in this first third is uh, give up the idea you don't need correction. You know, my son, don't despise the Lord's discipline and so on. And then he leads into the teaching on that. First five and six this is what I believe it's saying give up the idea you can determine your own choices course and direction and destiny give up the idea that you can determine your own choices courses and direction and destiny trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding in all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths or he will make your path straight give up the idea that you can do this alone. Give up the idea that you can choose a university and a college. Give up the idea that you can choose a home and a house, a mate for life. Give up the idea that you can become an entrepreneur and a business person, that you can have a wonderful marriage and family. Give up the idea that you can do this on your own. That's what he's saying, I think. Taken with all the Proverbs, and this is, the, I'm just going to conclude final thoughts on this proverb. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the proverb because this is one you know so well. Taken with all the Proverbs, though, to trust in the Lord is to rely on the Torah, the Word of God. If you read Proverbs 1, where the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and you read Proverbs right through, right through to Proverbs 30, including 31 maybe, there's one theme. God's wisdom is contained within the law of God. That's where the law is. So what he's saying here is not some subjective uh, emotional experience. Taken with all Proverbs when he says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart, he's saying trust in the word of God, the Torah. It would have been the Torah that this daddy was teaching the son, by the way. That would have been the teaching. He didn't have the New Testament as we had. And we understand that because the, the parallel phrase, Proverbs, uh, Hebrew literature is written in parallel where some are synonymous, some are in contrast, and some are explanatory. This one is one that explains what it means. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not on thine own understanding. In other words, there is an area of wisdom that you need to get from the Word of God, not from your thinking. Now we learned that in Psalm 1, which many Hebrew scholars believe is kind of the gateway to the Proverbs. You know, meditate on the law day and night. Meditate on the law day and night. So,
taken with the Proverbs when he's saying trust in the Lord, it, it might include a subjective feeling of, oh, I, I'm just believing in God. Or it's, What it's really, though, saying is put your reliance in the Torah, the Word of God, and in our case, the Bible. The guidance here has more to do with morality and ethics. This is where we often get off base in Proverbs. Proverbs is describing two things. Describing a wise person and a foolish person. Proverbs is describing a prudent person or a simple-minded person. Proverbs is describing two paths of life. Path of life, path of destruction, a path of righteousness, and a crooked, perverse path. So I need to say this with, again with an element of caution. This is not a verse to claim when you are applying to whether, is it U of C or U of A? Is it Mary that I marry? Or is it Susie that I marry? Well, I'm going to marry Susie. Well, how do you know? Well, I'm just trusting in the Lord. No. This is a verse that is a comfort and an encouragement and a blessing to the church to know that as we trust and rely on the Word of God, we will be led in ethical, moral, righteous living. I can't say that any clearer. The end goal here is righteous living, not whether I get a new Silverado. Please understand that. The goal is righteous living. It's holiness. We're being promised to be led into holiness if we trust in the Torah. That's what's being taught here. The idea of leading in straight paths is contrasted with the rest of the book, crooked paths. In other words, the path that sinful people take. So if, if little young Robbie here is my boy, and you look so good today, dressed up for daddy for church. Yeah, nice. Glad you shaved, honey. <laughs> now, son, you're leaving home. If you believe God's word, God will lead you in holiness. That's what he's saying. That's what he's saying. Don't dance with this beyond what was intended. And all of you know what I just said is true. There's not a single believer in this room who just said, said, yeah, that's right. If we hold to the teaching of God's word, if we trust it in our lives, he will lead us in holiness and righteousness and paths of goodness. We know that to be true. Rely on God's wisdom and not your own, and he will lead you in righteousness. That's a summary statement I make of this verse. Rely on God's wisdom, not your own. And he will lead you in righteousness. I like what the ESV study Bible notes say. The wise will govern themselves by what the Lord himself declares and will not set their own finite and often mistaken understanding against his. Does, everyone, does that make sense to everyone? We will govern our lives by what God says in his word and will not rely on our own finite. The word finite means limited. Often mistaken. How many of you had made, have made, made every perfect decision even up till today? Half the day is gone. Already you've made absolute perfect decisions in everything you did. A lot of heads are shaking. No. Okay, the confessional will be open after Sunday school. Get your pie recipes out because the penance is pie. Often mistaken. Like some of you are sitting beside people you love dearly. You're, you're married. You, but you know full well, if my wife was here, she'd be the first to say, I don't trust Jim. A hundred percent, a thousand percent. Why? Because it's Jim. He's finite. He's limited. He's sinful. He's stupid. 
in many ways. He, he's still learning. It doesn't mean she doesn't trust me at all, but she doesn't rest on my word. She rests on the word of God as to guide her. That's what this verse is teaching us. Let's say it again. Read it with me. Bear with me, those of you who use different translations. You're free to use your own to, to memorize. But Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. Amen.